Well, welcome all. Um, it's really exciting to see all of you uh, flowing into this webinar today. Really excited about it. And as people to continue to come in, I'll just start off um, and welcome you. And uh, say, I'm, my name is Peter Allison. I'm the Executive Director of Farmed Institution New England, or FIND. And we're the hosts of the uh, webinar today featuring the butternut story, butternut soup story, um, and all the ingredients of success with some great uh, guest presenters to join us for presentation and some questions and answers. I think a really, really dynamic um, story. Just a little bit about FINE. Um, as many of you know, we are an organization that serves the dynamic network of uh, communities, organizations, and institutions working together to create a just, equitable, and sustainable food system in New England and beyond. And uh, Tanya, if you can, next slide. And the next slide. Um, as a support organization, we do a, a number of different things, like conducting research and um, uh, sharing information, bringing people together. One of our biggest events uh, is the Farm to Institution Summit that we hold every two years. The last one was down in Providence, Rhode Island in April of 2023. And we're already gearing up for the next one in the spring of 2025. Um, next slide. Between the summits, um, we decided that we really wanted to continue the energy and enthusiasm that we've been um, sort of building on and capturing since the last summit. And by doing this um, webinar series. And so, we're going to be holding uh, webinars um, most months coming this spring. This is the second one in the series. And our next one will actually be in April. Um, and today we have the webinar focused on the butternut story, which is really an exciting, um, really exciting story of our network in operation and a dynamic partnership that started just this past fall although some of the relationships existed before, to um, source 5,000 pounds of butternut and turning that into 1,000 gallons of delicious, nutritious soup, serving you know, thousands of um, re uh, patients and, and visitors to hospitals in Boston. Uh, all of that on budget, on time, and really extraordinary series of uh, events that led to that. And we're really fortunate today to have three of the key partners with us, uh, next slide please, who played a really critical role in working with their organizations and their partners to bring this effort together. Um, Amy Galvin is the general manager for Bay Ridge Hospital and Sustainability and Wellness um, coordinator for the Beth Israel Leahy Health System. And she's worked to reduce food waste across retail, catering, and patient services for the BILH hospital system that consists of 14 different hospitals. She was the recipient of the Jane Matlaw Environmental Champion Award in 2022 for her commitment to helping greater Boston communities meet their challenges of environmental sustainability. Um, Kevin um, Doherty is the Director of Culinary Operations for Commonwealth Kitchen. He's a Boston-born uh, chef who began his career in the French Quarter of New Orleans before moving into roles in cu culinary production development and commissary operations. Um, he's created products for companies such as Starbucks, Clover Food Lab, the Works Bakery chain, and Live Nation. When he's not cooking, he supports sustainability initiatives, food waste, and packaging waste reduction, uh, helping small family farmers and organizations such as Farm Aid, as well as being an active, um, avid artist and musician. And um, Annie Broad is the manager of Boston Food Hub, which is a program of the nonprofit Boston Area Gleaners. Um, Boston, the Boston Food Hub connects New England farms with reliable wholesale markets 
with the goal to reduce on-farm surplus, improve farmer viability, and increase access to local um, and fresh produce. The Food Hub operates year-round and distributes fresh food and vegetables to customers across Central and Eastern Mass. And we're super excited to have all three of you with here with us here today. Um, we encourage all of you to introduce yourselves via chat, uh, put in your name and affiliation. And also, as we're going through, please feel free to put questions in chat. We'll be capturing those, and I think we'll have a good amount of time for questions at the end, which I'm sure you'll have um, based on the short presentations that Annie, Kevin, and Annie start us off with. Um, so Amy, let me turn it over to you to get us started in your role with the hospitals and sort of what your perspective on this story was. Thank you. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. We're really excited to share our story with you. Um, so this is kind of where it all started. And the joke amongst the Dexo was that this was going to be our Christmas card last year. And now it's kind of been making the rounds for LinkedIn as well as um, this wonderful webinar. Um, so really it all started with uh, Kevin and Jen inviting us down and, you know, for our tasting and just some, you know, really good conversation. And we love the food and it was the perfect opportunity for us to be very candid with each other um, and really get to know kind of you know, what they were doing at the Commonwealth Kitchen and kind of what it looked like on our side um, within Sodexo and healthcare. And, you know, it was the best time for us to really sit down and say, all right, like we love your food, but how do we buy it? Um, and Kevin and Jen had a lot of really great questions for us. Um, and we had two senior leaders with us during this visit. So Chef Rich, um, as well as Susan Langhill from the Brigham, and they encourage us to ask those questions. Um, so Jesse, Janina, and I work as a team amongst our three systems, and we went back to our client executives and, um, you know, just started asking a lot of questions that I don't think that any of us were really familiar with, like how does supply chain work within Sodexo? Um, how do we get things into our purchasing platform? Um, and really just opening those floodgates. Um, next, next slide, please. And so from there, we really got together. Um, I know that at one point, Kevin came to us and said, well, how do you feel about 10,000 pounds of squash? And at one point we went to, um, you know, our client executives and said, how do you feel about 10,000 pounds of squash turned into 2,000 gallons of soup? And they said, well, you know, you, Jesse and Janina are, are really kind of, this is your first project where you're gonna try to create something with the Commonwealth Kitchen. How about we do 5,000 pounds? Um, and really, you know, the kind of theme I think that we've always been running with has been like, the answer is always no if you don't ask. Um, and so we took that 5,000 pounds of squash and created a thousand gallons of butternut squash soup. Um, and it's, you know, Kevin and his team were really great about meeting our specifications. So we wanted to make sure that it was going to be okay for our patients on tray line, um, as well as guests in our cafeterias, our retail spaces. And Kevin nailed it. I mean, the soup is amazing. It's delicious. Um, you know, patients have had a lot of positive feedback. Our guests have had a lot of positive feedback for us. Um, and so working together, really to make sure that we can bring farm to table to patients has been a great success. Um, next slide, please. Um, so a lot of people within our hospitals have been getting creative. Our chefs are um, always willing to play in our kitchens. And so they've been doing a lot of fun things. Um, one chef made a tortellini with a roasted butternut squash soup using that soup as a base. Um, we've had a couple other chefs make risottos and just a bunch of other retail specials for people to enjoy. Um, one of the other asks that, you know, we've had within our cafeterias, especially because we have a lot of healthcare workers, is, is that they'd like to purchase it and bring it home, um, especially during the winter months. We've seen a pretty good rise in that. And so 
we instructed, you know, we made labels. Um, we bought these containers. We we're putting them in our grab and go areas and that's been working out really well. Um, and so just making sure, I think it's been a learning experience for all of us um, because people are coming to us and say, you know, saying different things or they've wanted to, you know, toy around with the soup. I know that my unit did this really large, um, they had bread bowls and they had all sorts of different toppings and people just really enjoyed that. Um, next question, next slide, please. And so what's next is gathering feedback from our hospitals. Um, we really wanna make sure that we continue to hear from people that are in these spaces. Not every hospital is going to have the same opinions um, and we wanna bring more people to the table. And so part of the way we've done that is we've invited our chefs um, you know, to start giving us their suggestions. What are some things that they would like to see? What are some things that they'd like to toy around with? Um, whether that's a pasta sauce or if it's another soup or a ragu. Um, and we'd really like to start hearing from the farmers. And we've started having conversations um, with Kevin and Annie about what's next. And I think that's, you know, what this is all about. Continuing, like getting the ball rolling, making sure that this isn't just a one-off initiative we really want to make sure that we're, you know, getting creative with it and we're, we're hearing them, right? So what do the farmers have that we would like to see in our kitchens? What are things that we would like to give our patients? Um, and I, I think that we've done a really great job over here and we've had, a, our leadership is very supportive. Um, and I really appreciate that we've had all of the support, not only from our surrounding communities, um, but also just each other. I think that that's really important. And I think that's it for me. Next slide, please. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Darty, the Director of Culinary Operations here at Commonwealth Kitchen. Next slide, please. A little higher level in what we do and what we are about is we, Peter used the word equity. And that's part of our, overarching mission here is we want to grow out the food infrastructure and particularly bring along, you know, everyone underserved in food deserts and food inequity areas from farm. And part of this project is the story of how um, Commonwealth Kitchen is nimble and can um, leverage its relationships to try to um, very quickly identify opportunities um, like the one um, Amy presented us. Next slide, please. Um, in, in Commonwealth, we're a little bit of an outlier in what shared kitchens are and that we're one of the larger ones, but we also um, have built into it the ability to take small businesses, grow them, and pack them off to co-manufacturing um, and really help them scale up. So we're really trying to work with accounts, um, like in this case, Sodexo, to um, you know, outsource manufacturing, we can take it on, we can take an industry partner like in Sodexo and try to get the market access. Next slide, please. And in so doing, you know, we have 53 current shared kitchen members, but through the course of Commonwealth Kitchen, 600 businesses have passed through here and um, gone on to do greater, um, bigger and better things. 78% of uh, the businesses are Black, Indigenous, people of color. 78% uh, of our women, 65% are immigrant, and 94% in total, as you can see, are a combination of Black, Indigenous, people of color, or women-owned. So in our ecosystem, we're bringing that underserved um, community and bringing equity to it. Um, next slide, please. And part of that is supporting our farmers. So you can't grow out a farm system you can't grow out a food system unless you get local. And there's a lot of great produce in New England. And there's a lot of people producing product that just are trying to get market access. So it might be a touch of uh, value added product where they need some you know, mid-level processing. And from that mid-level processing, they need uh, an outlet to sell it. So here comes the story of the soup. Next slide, please. Um, it, it, when approached, about, you know, from a managed server, a managed service contract um, provider about an in inquiry about a soup. Like, yes, we can do it. How can we do it? Yes, we can leverage what, what's in our uh, ecosystem and find the sourcing 
But getting that out of the way, we worked through the distribution. The uh, Amy was very, very clear in saying and giving us direction on taste, flavor, allergen, viscosity for dysphagia. And when those things are presented to you, you're really just taking something great, local produce, making a product, you know, turning it around and asking yourself all the questions that someone would want to know about that. How are we getting it? How's it being packed? How much can you produce? How long does it last? And, um, you know, target what their price point's going to be, what they need to be able to spend for it. So, you know, I started high, you know, I started with 10,000 pounds and Annie will tell you that that's a drop in the bucket and it is, but the, the story in um, 5,000 pounds into 10,000 gallons isn't really about what we produce. It's, it's that from ideation to launch in that six week period or two months, we were able to get to a product that went from 14 hospitals to 22, but opened a door on a pipeline to go farm direct to mid-level producer to manage a service contract and serve a uh, New England produce healthy um, uh, patient or regular customer, anyone going through a healthcare product. So I think a lot of um, the key, and and this is the partnership. My my mentor and, and uh, executive director here always says that a partnership will um, move at the speed of trust. And I think that that that's the the behind the scenes story of this butternut soup is that. You know, Amy, Amy put herself out there to get this project done. And I, I you know, we took a chance here to get it done. And uh, Annie, for her involvement, it was like, it's not a lot, but it's something. And everyone came together to make it happen. And um, that's the speed of trust that made this uh, work from my end of it. Uh, next slide, please. I think I'm, I think it's my last slide. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, Kevin. And Annie, you can uh, round us out. Yeah. Um, uh, my name is Annie Broad. I'm the manager of Boston Food Hub, which, as Peter mentioned, is a program of the nonprofit Boston Area Gleaners. Uh, next slide. And uh, how Kevin ended his section really about the relationship and the partnership is really how I want to start off, you know, our story behind our involvement with the butternut soup. And that's really our relationship with the farm. So Plainville Farm uh, grew and harvested the uh, butternut squash. Wally and Mary Zakowski, who you see here, have been farming um, for uh, many generations. Uh, the the, the Zakowskis are very well-known, established uh, farmers in Western Mass. And butternut squash not only happens to be our logo as Boston Food Hub, but also as, as Wally. So butternut really just was a, a great product to start with, something that is, you know, grown in abundance in Massachusetts, in New England, and ready, readily available at the time of year that we did this project, which was end of December. Um, and so yeah, it's a huge, huge crop from that for them. And uh, Plainville Farm has been a big supporter of Boston Food Hub and likewise really since our inception just a few years ago. And we're still selling butternut squash right now. It's one of our, our longest standing storage crops. So really just great availability to begin with. So a really a smart, safe item to start with when we think of a project like this. Uh, a few other values that Plainville Farm themselves brought to the table was not only the capacity and volume that they have on the production side, so, you know, they, they had the supply of the butternut, but they do their own peeling and uh, having and also cubing of butternut squash, so that really made the product uh, it brought it to the point where Kevin and his team could then handle the product and, and turn it into soup. So that lightly process is really an incredible value that Plainville Farm um, and our relationship with them uh, had to make this story happen. Um, the other aspect was the packaging side. You know, we haven't touched much much on budget, but you know, there was a price point where we needed to hit. Um, we don't negotiate with our farmers. We let our farmers set their price, and that's exactly what we did. But we're able to save money on the packaging side of things. So, because the product was uh, really packed in bulk, so these big gay Gaylord uh, squash bins um, with a plastic liner, you know, the, the squash themselves were were wrapped, um, saved us a lot of money on packaging. And that's also easier for the farmer. So it's less for them to pack. It's less cost. It's easier to move. Um, you know, when you're dealing with that amount of volume, you don't want to have to unpack, you know, 
uh, several hundred boxes of, of, of wax containers, which is, which is what it would typically come in. Um, so those few components that Plainville Farm was able to bring to the table were, were really substantial. Uh, next slide. And then really, uh, you know, I want to talk about the logistics and the infrastructure um, and that that made this happen. So, you know, we are a distributor. We are picking up the product with, with our trucks. We are bringing it back to our facility in Acton where we're storing and aggregating the product for individual orders as needed and delivering, making that final delivery of the product. So the trucks, the drivers, the operation staff behind that work, um, the cold storage, all that infrastructure is an extremely necessary in this value chain chain that we're operating. Um, you know, as a, as a food hub um, working within the value chain, you know, we're trying to shorten the local supply chain and have there be a much shorter distance between where the product is sourced and where it's going. Um, uh, and, you know, our relationship with, with Commonwealth Kitchen was, was that great was was really the right place for the product to go for it to then go through a couple more hands you know from commonwealth and then the distribution needed to the hospitals um but that's really what made this happen um was also the the streamlined relationship um a little bit about you know our relationship with with commonwealth kitchen kevin and i have have worked together over the past year you know thinking about different projects to work on and we did a tomato sauce project in the summer and this this butternut project was really the next thing so we kind of kind of flushed out some things last summer when we we did some tomato sauce for a couple partners and that really also set the the stepping stone for the next project and similarly to to what amy mentioned you know a lot of this is you know not this specific project but it's what's next you know how can we continue to help farmers get into institutions what are the right value add items um for that that level of of business and um how can we make this happen and i think this this project was was really in a great example of yes we can do it and what what can we do next uh, next slide yeah, just a, a couple pictures about the the infrastructure and our, our trucks and loading dock and our facility really are the backbone of of the work that we do. Um, you know, we offer over 100 different items, um, work with over 40 farms across Massachusetts, a little bit in, in other New England states, primarily focusing on on Massachusetts now, but really just the the extent of our work is it isn't possible without the infrastructure and logistics and relationships behind it all. Next slide. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Annie, Kevin, and Amy. That was great. Um, as I mean, you've you all painted the story really sort of eloquently, and I have to say, it almost sounded a little bit easy. Um, I'm guessing there were parts of the story that actually were were challenging. And I'm wondering if if each of you or some of you could point to some of the things that that actually were challenging, where this thing could have gone sideways at some part of the process. And what did it take to sort of pull it back and and make it succeed? Um, Amy, I'm seeing you nodding. I'm wondering if you want to jump in first. Um, so I know that when we were first talking about this, we were kind of laughing and talking about the night, the late nighttime calls that we've had, the leader meetings we've had. <laughs> um, it, I don't, I don't know if anybody remembers the Rugrats and like Angelica had the, the little doll Cynthia, like her hair was all messed up, but like that was a meme that I would frequently share out with Jesse and Janina and, <laughs> um, a lot of it's just making because it, this is very kind of new in a lot of ways a lot of it is just trying to navigate what it's going to look like and I really can't say enough like I think that Sodexo really has a good model um for Jesse Janina and I we have a great project manager his name is Andrew um we meet weekly with our client executives so Steve and Karen and Mark um, and Reggie, our vice president, is always very willing to hear us. And we have so much support. Um, but sometimes, you know, like when it was deciding, like, well, how do you sign an MOU? Or who sends a letter of intent? And 
like what how much space is a pallet really going to take up and how much space does somebody's freezer have like those are things that anybody thinks about on a regular basis I don't think I've ever once thought about what supply chain does until this project and really getting to talk to them and you know they're coming back with us with like well, how many pallets is that going to create? And I'm like, I don't like, I'm thinking about things in gallons. You're you know, thinking about things in real estate. And I think it really changed Jesse, Janina and I's perspective because there's so many different parts that we just weren't aware of. And I think that's what this whole project really taught us is, you know, there's so many moving parts behind every single thing that you're doing and you just don't realize. And so you always have to ask those questions no matter how like silly they you think they are, or, you know, if you think somebody is gonna be judgy, like you really need to ask those questions because oftentimes you're missing these massive parts of how you get farm to table to patients. And this was like, I think that was the biggest lesson from this. And so now I know, right? Whenever I want to do something next with Kevin, I'm going to have to start thinking in pallet spaces rather than gallons or... <laughs> great. I think that was really the big takeaway though. That's great. Kevin or Annie, any uh, any things that were unexpected or challenges that you had to come up with some creative solutions around? I mean, I could jump in there. Like the answer is always going to be no, like if you don't ask the question, right, Amy? So I, I had to see the whole thing from the back, you know, patient eating soup in hospital and go all the way to how you get there and then and then see where the roadblock is going to be. And I knew, I always knew price at the unit level was going to be a challenge for Sodexo, right? So I needed to match that price. But then getting it to them and working out the distro the, in, in food is hard, but a, a lot of why food is hard is in the distribution in the middle. And part of like the solving for X on this was going into those meetings with those distributors questions in mind. You know, uh, they're gonna say, how many pallets? What's the shelf life? What's the lot code? What's the poundage? How long's the run? And if if you go in there and you can, you know, um, answer the questions before they're asked and make it as smooth of a, a transition for, in this case, Amy, the client, in this case, the distribution by having everything. And then here working out around, you know, food is grown in the dirt and it's dying from the minute that it's cultivated or pulled out. So we take in Annie's peeled or, or Plainville's peeled. I have a, I'm on the clock for how long it takes me to produce that, you know, so I, I have to, figure out how much I could pr produce a day, how much I could store per day, how much the middle person can take per day. But if you work all that throughout, 5,000 can become 10,000, 10,000 be can become 20. We um, did 16,000 pounds of local um, farm, small farm produce last year. It's a, it's a dent, but, but um, potentially, you know, we could be doing that in these, uh, exceeding that, you know, by 4X in, in, in soup if we do this right. So I think anticipating the problem is, is a, a huge part to solving the problem. Annie? Yeah, I um, to follow up on that, I'd say this wasn't a problem because I think we were on top of it, but timing could have been a problem. You know, we were talking about doing this and, you know, we were here like post Thanksgiving, getting into December. And I'm like, you know, we're still going to have squash for a little while longer, but I just don't know how much longer and how much. So we should do this now if we want to do it. So getting on top of the availability and knowing that we're going to be in, in good in good supply when that project was ready to happen. Like I know, Kevin, you needed to have the production uh, freed up to to do that. Um, I also thought communication was was really strong. I think this was put on my radar really early. So that allowed me to put it on the farmer's radar. Um, and like, you know, this is coming down the pipeline. I'm not quite sure when we're gonna need it yet. Um, but just so they were anticipating that because anything last minute, it never goes well. Um, so the anticipation of it, even if details weren't entirely in place yet, um, was preventative from from really any any issues. Um, you know, I mean, depending on the time of, of year, you know, weather can always be a factor when it comes to to trucking and distribution. Again, I think being in December, we were a little bit safer. But you know, if there was a delay because of a snowstorm, and um, you know, 
delivery got pushed out a day, you know, that really impacts Kevin's production. Um, so really staying on top of that and timing things appropriately, I thought um, was was really well done. But yeah, really, really no hiccups, hiccups on our end. Um, you know, no, no, no. What would it end up being like five, five bins or so it was about a thousand per bin. So yeah, five, five pallet spaces, um, you know, not, not, not too significant on, on our end, you know, we can hold up to 20 plus pallets in, in a truck, depending on, on the truck. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're used to delivering into Commonwealth kitchen, so that wasn't anything new for us. So the, the logistics and the process of the distribution were, were all in place. Amy had a really good point about technology and communication. I initially reached out to her on the New England Food Processor Slack channel and immediately got a price back. And with with Amy, we were in, you know, every other day communication, uh, either in biz dev through uh, Sheree at the time, it's like business can move at the speed of communication too. And, and, and in this case, having that ecosystem of communication, in this case, the food uh, process of hub Slack channel, it really helped, you know, like what I've reached out to uh, Plainville on my own. Um, it's just really super helpful to have a, a resource like, you know, Boston Food Hub to say, hey, I can get 3,000 from here and 2,000 here, 5,000 from here if needed. Um, it's one call or one Slack for me and to the right person and, and then Annie works it out. Thanks, each of you. That was that added a lot of value. We've got uh, uh, quite a few questions coming in. So let's see how we can uh, can get to those. These are great. Thank you all for submitting them. Uh, Dorothy Supit um, has asked if you all could talk about some of the funding that made this possible. Were there any um, specific grants, investments, uh, revenue streams that um, that you would care to talk to that sort of helped and whether it was dedicated to this particular project or just to your sort of infrastructure overall. And I know, you know, Sodexo has, uh, one sort of revenue stream and, in, in Commonwealth Kitchen and, and Boston Urban Gardeners, um, have, have different, but Boston Food Hub. Um, but Kevin, let me actually start with you. Was there any, uh, grants that go into the infrastructure or investments that have been really critical to enabling this to happen? Um, there, are, there are grants for this particular project. It was almost like a straight sale. Um, we, we were commissioned to do a project. We set price point. Uh, Amy got approval. We did it. But we have um, had grants, um, food safety initiative grants, things from MassDAR, things from USDA for the uh, farm VAP uh, work that we do that might not be specific to this one project, but yes, there is grant money that, you know, um, funds some of the work that we do here in small family farming, not on this particular project, particular project. And Annie, um, does the food hub have, you know, you have sales revenue, is there other sort of soft funds that help support your operations? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're a nonprofit, so we heavily rely on, you know, grants, uh, donations, uh, you know, foundations, governmental. So we've got an incredible development team that that keeps us going. Yeah. And Amy, I mean, you are you're in the corporate world. Um, were there any particular um, cost implications or sort of needs to draw on funds from, you know, one one division to another, or did this just fit within your typical um, purchasing revenue stream, uh, cost and revenue stream? Yeah, so Kevin and Costa are really great about working with us um, and being mindful of what our tree costs are, as well as what our cost of soup would be in our retail spaces. Um, I think that they both did a great job. Great. Um, Andy, we've talked about this a little bit before, but obviously a lot of farms in New England got hit hard by the um, floods this fall. And butternut in particular was was hurt in certain areas. Um, the farm you worked with wasn't impacted as much, that is, is my understanding. And, and did you see that with some of the other farms that you were working with? Yeah, I mean, the impact of, of flooding was really specific to each farm's location and, um, you know, the how low or high lying their fields are. Um, Plainville did lose some some butternut 
but they still had enough fields and higher ground that were salvageable. I mean, it will be a shorter year for them than usual. Typically, we'll have butternut through uh, mid-March, and we're going to be done in the next week or two. So we're a few weeks earlier than we typically are, so it is going to be a shorter season. Um, but yeah, it, it really differs um, farm to farm on their impact from the weather last year. But it, butternut was specifically um hit um because of the the water causes a uh, disease that um uh, cause premature rot great and uh another question for you from lottie up at um just cut in vermont at the center for ag um and environment is that does uh plainfield plainville farm has had the um processing equipment for butternut for a while right they didn't bring that equipment in um recently yeah no they they do a lot they do a lot of retail packs they have a great partner partnership with with big y so they've been doing um lightly processed uh butternut for a while that's the only crop that they do any processing for um their brother does does some other items um down the road but uh, plainville specifically only does the butternut so that's really their specialty right peter great. i'd like to tell into that Part of our buying that product is that we have processing equipment here. We diced everything for an Urschel that we own. The costing assumption would have been different if it was cut into dices rather than just peeled. And also there's a question on the board um, from Jessica Brennan who asks, sounds like CWK was the initiator for this effort, is it correct? And broadly, and maybe Amy could take this, what factors of uh, Sodexo makes something like this possible. Um, for me, my understanding was the So Local program that um, we, there's a program to buy product local and um, we didn't really initiate this product. It was mentioned in passing about doing a holiday soup for the program. It was a Sodexo driven um, idea, but we just really quickly jumped on it. I think we, we spoke at the end of September and by December 4th, we were in hospitals. You know, I think two weeks after the conversation, we had scaled recipes and samples out. So um, I, I believe this is all part of So Local, Amy. Uh, yep. So myself, Jesse, and Janina um, have really been pushing a campaign through the Sodexo Healthcare for all of New England. Um, it's called So Local. We encourage um, all hospitals within New England to... Um, to participate in these campaigns. Um, so either it's a soup or a local vendor um, or highlighting certain local items within their cafeterias, on their tray lines and their retail spaces. And our, we're always thinking about what's next. So what's the next thing that we're gonna do, right? Because it can't just be a one-off thing because that's how people stop being engaged. And it's you know how people stop really focusing on you know what, how are we going to be more sustainable? Um, and so really coming up with that soup was great because we were like, oh, you know, like everybody loves butternut squash soup. It's amazing, right? Um, and so Jesse, Janina, and I put together a toolkit. We reached out to all of the Sodexo managers within New England. Um, we sent out that toolkit. We made it really easy for them. And we've seen over, I want to say, 20, 30 hospitals order it. And now we just opened up to Sodexo campus as well so that some of the students could eat it. Um, so really we're trying to spread this in as many Sodexo um, accounts as we can. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, another question for you, Amy, is did you need to do anything um, in house in terms of keeping it frozen or cold or how did you, store it? Um... Nope. So all of the hospitals um, are able to order directly from Costa. The soup is already frozen. It's already in a case. Um, each case contains three one gallon bags. Um, so all depending on how large your hospital and now including campuses, however, you know, large your unit is, um, you can just pull as much as you need. So really you're eliminating waste there as well. Um, but they just put them in their freezer. Um, and so some of my hospitals are currently using this on our tray line. Um, and so, you know, it's very easy for them to pull one bag, you know, per meal service, all depending on how many patients are going to be eating it for that meal period. Um, so we, I haven't, you know, we haven't had any problems. Nobody's freezer has been going down, knock on wood. <laughs> and all of the units have found it very easy. 
Excellent. Um, and there's sort of a question at follow up for if you were to have done the processing in house, if you got cut butternut yourselves um, on a cost comparison basis, did this work out better for you? I mean, presumption is that's one of the reasons you did it, but just curious if you even would have had the capacity to take the raw product and make it at all these hospitals on it within your own kitchens. I don't think that we would have, um, especially right now. I know that you know, all of the hospitals are very busy. Um, we are seeing a rise in patients, and I don't know that all of our chefs would have been able to do that. I don't, you know, I think we really took a lot of that lift, not only off of the chefs, but also the patient service managers as well as uh, the retail managers. Um, and that that's really the whole goal with um, Jesse, Janina, and I's so local campaigns. You know, we don't want to say, hey, we want you to go buy, you know, 30 pounds of squash and create a soup in your hospital. That's not going to help anybody, <laughs> you know, and they're probably not going to do it. Um, but if we do it for them, when we give them the tools to be successful, they're absolutely going to do it. And they're, and they're going to have fun with it. Hmm. Great. Um, Andy, there's a couple questions for you, one of which is you were able to source all this product from one farm. Uh, would it have made a difference to you if you had to aggregate from multiple farms or, or how would that have changed things if, if, if at all? Yeah, the challenge there is I don't know really any other farms that are doing their own peeling and cutting. Um, so if if Commonwealth was taking in whole unpeeled butternut, yes, we could have sourced from multiple farms, but really the caveat is the the lightly processing that was done. Um, so I guess if there are multiple farms doing that, um, but uh, no, this was pretty limited to just sourcing from Plainville. Right. And at what point would you need to do any sort of production planning with farmers um, or do you do production planning with farmers for you know, this or any other products based on some of your customers' uh, demands? Or could you envision that being something that you get into in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think the butternut worked because we didn't need to do that. And it was like, you know, what can we do now? And it was like, okay, this is what's available now in the right format necessary for for the processing and, and the soup. Um, we do some forward contracting with growers, you know, based on the, the volume that we move, we're able to, to make some commitments. It's definitely a goal to be able to do more of that as buyers are established and regular volume is established. Um, but for, for this specific project, we didn't, but going forward, it's definitely something that we can do as we think of, you know, what other seasonal soups or items can, can we make? And then, um, you know, if it's something that typically isn't in extremely good abundance, you know, I think the price point is, is definitely a trickier piece that will need attention. Um, so it kind of does limit product being pulled from some of the larger growers um, in, in the state and even, you know, thinking about more regionally, um, who, who can we, we source from at the scale necessary uh, to, to meet the needs of, of the volume of this product. Great. Um, that led to me doing farmer outreach too. speak with um, Annie about what what is to come in the cycle and what the soups could be led me to talk to Bonita at um, uh, DAR about um, sourcing mushrooms, which led me to talk to the at Fat Boyer uh, Microterra Farms, which then I thought, hey, wait, up, why don't I take a spent grain or an upcycled grain or upcycled product along for for the ride? So it, it spreads out. It starts with butternut. And now, now we can start working in some other type of product that otherwise would not be making it into a, a marketplace, much in the way that we do a, a field pea fritter, a crop cover fritter that puts the nitrogen back in the soil. We're scaling up to the point where we were 10 pallets, we might be 20 pallets, but as that throughput expands, that's more usable product that instead of being tilled under is naturally curing this, uh, uh, the soil for a product that didn't pre-exist. That's great. I'd like to um, turn a little bit to sort of what's down the road, what's in the future, where are we going? I do see a question, a hand raised by uh, Giannina Padula. If you want to take yourself off mute and ask it yourself, that's fine. I was just going to chime in um, regarding the other question about 
um, like if we were to do something like this on site or the um, plausibility of that labor being taken on. Um, first and foremost, I think for this project and many more in the future, we really have been focusing on strengthening our relationship with Commonwealth Kitchen and with other local um, businesses and farms. Um, but also we've been learning something new with each so local event. And some feedback that we've heard a lot is that the teams really appreciate having more streamlined initiatives because I know the culinary teams are always juggling so many other tasks. Um, so I think because of that, it made more sense that we would have a specific product recommended for this um, specific so local event and making that available for multiple months really helped them to incorporate that more easily in their menus. Um, and I think that also in recent years, we're realizing that people not only want food that tastes great, but they're really looking for food that makes them feel good and then that they can feel they make a difference when eating and choosing. Um, so we've seen our hospitals being more intentional with sourcing and bringing patients these nutrient rich foods that also help to foster those local farms and businesses. And it was just really great to work with Commonwealth Kitchen and Boston Food Hub and Plainville Farms on this project. And I think We've learned so much that will make the next steps and the the future collaborations on um, other different recipes uh, much more streamlined in the future. And I'm looking forward to see how we can incorporate those into future so local events. Thanks. Um, and Giannina is a colleague of Amy's at Sedexa, part of the, the vast team that um, work there. And there's a question if... Uh, you folks can put some links in the chat related to the So Local program. There's some interest in folks learning a little bit more about that. And that, that may have happened earlier. Um, thanks. So um, I guess starting to, to you, Amy, um, you know, as Farm to Institution New England, one of the common questions we get is, how do we sell to food service management companies? Um, they're they're a slightly different customer than uh, self-operated facilities. They have different rules and um, requirements and opportunities. What would you say? Um, are there any sort of general tips for either producers or hubs or processors who have product that they're interested in getting into a hospital or an institutional market? What are the what are some of the do's and don'ts um, that you would point to there? Um, so this is actually a really good question. <laughs> I I think the most important thing is make sure that you're talking to the right person. Um, I think that oftentimes, and I've noticed this pretty frequently recently is um, I get these emails or these messages on LinkedIn and they're not talking to the right person. I don't book events for anybody. I don't book events for my employees. I don't book events for managers. Um, and sometimes, you know, I'm just not the right person to talk to. And I try to kind of direct them to the right pipeline. Um, and I, I think that's the most important thing, right? Um, and then I think second would be what, you know, really explaining kind of what you're trying to bring to us and why, you know, how are we going to, how is your product different than something we already have? Um, because really that's what is going to be needed to kind of make this successful. Um, and I think, you know, always ask, right? Like shoot your shot because we don't, you know, we don't know. And Jesse and Gina, like I keep going back to it, but the answer is always no, if you don't ask. Um, and I can say that even during this project, I think I reached out to probably 10 people who had nothing to do with anything that I was trying to do. But they were like, oh, if you talk to this person, they can help you. Mm -hmm. And eventually you get to the right person. So, you know, that would be my suggestion is ask, but make sure you're asking, you know, the right person. And if you're not asked, make sure that you can be like guided to where you're trying to go. Right. Thanks. Um... And perseverance definitely seems like a, one of the the themes that we're hearing here. Um, so Kevin and then Annie, you both have had efforts successful and otherwise at trying to reach the institutional market. Are there things that you would um, 
put out as you know guides or suggestions to folks who are interested in getting their product to to you know this hospital or institutions in general Kevin I can jump in because I think the like uh, relationships that we have here really made this happen. You know, Boston Food Hub is, does, did not have a relationship with Sodexo prior to this, nor were we or are we technically an approved vendor. You know, we were able to work through the process um, through Commonwealth, which then the product, you know, needed to go to Costa for the the um, final dis distribution. Um, so I think it's like just taking a, a bigger look to see, you know, how, how does this supply chain work and how and if you're a farmer or a supplier, you know, is that the right connection? Are you going to go direct to them or do you really need a distribution partner there or a processing partner to make it happen? So thinking about, you know, who are the, the partners that are already uh, working within this ecosystem as opposed to starting from scratch? Um, you know, a lot of the work might already be done for you as long as you make the right connections. Thank you. Yeah, and there's a couple of things in, in there. A question was asked about, do we reach out to the farm? Do the farm reach out to us? Food safety has got to be paramount, paramount in anything that we do here. And, you know, not every farm is GAP certified, good agricultural practices. You have to, you know, bring quality ingredients in. And uh, like I said earlier about the relationship, moving at the speed of trust, we know who we're working with. We know the product coming in. And I'd say anyone on this call trying to get into a managed service contract or get your product from a farm or through the, like do the work, know the need, know the price, figure out the barriers and tackle them beforehand. If you're gonna do a soup, it's gotta be a differentiator. If you're gonna do a pesto, you know, it might be a different type of pesto, garlic scape pesto, arugula pesto, you know, where, if if a managed service contract is looking at it on the on on the basis of price, you have to be somewhere in that range, and then you start ticking off those boxes: local, price compatible, unique unique product. You, you know, when you start making those decisions on the onset of like what I would call a brief, the product sells itself. Who doesn't want to buy local? Who doesn't want to support local agriculture? Who doesn't want something a little bit different? Um, that's what I would recommend to anyone on the call if you're trying to you know, break through. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, what's next? Each of you have mentioned, uh, to a certain extent, Kevin, you talked about some of the other products that you're already starting to think about. Uh, Amy and uh, Gianni, Nina, sorry about <laughs> putting your name there. Um, you clearly, with the So Local program, have other you know opportunities coming down the road. Annie, you're in the business of of moving food to uh, local food to distributors. What do you see um, down the pike, either in terms of partnerships with each other or other um, other local products and institutional supply chains that seem like they're promising for you at this point? So we've already started to have conversations about what's next. Um, and we're kind of just waiting to fill out a little bit of what the harvest is going to look like. Um, and so hopefully, you know, maybe in a couple more months, we can come back and we can show you something else that we've done. Um, but we're start certainly tossing ar around some ideas right now. Great. So we're working on a cycle menu of about six soups. We have the interest from Sodexo, but that could grow into university, QSR, um, other avenues where, you know, it's the, uh, rising tide lifts all boats, right? So if we have longer run rates, it brings the cost down for our, everyone. If we start seeing a repeated cycle through the year, we know that there are crop allocations that we'll be handling. So it starts, you know, this is a story, butternut, but it's really not a story, it's just the beginning. So, you know, it becomes, it starts soup, it could be pickled vegetables, kimchi. It could be something with kelp or seafood or any of the other things that are new and trendy that aren't out there and saturated. So for, for me, it's waiting for the next crop and the next uh, MOU to keep Amy up all night, wondering what she's going <laughs> to go back to her Sodexo overseas about. Great. And Annie, anything down the, the road for you all? Yeah, I mean, right now, availability, availability is getting pretty limited. Um, so yeah, thinking more down the road and, um, you know, Kevin and I have talked about things that 
you know, kind of came and went in terms of availability, things like cranberries or carrots or things that, you know, have been in really good abundance, potatoes, and how can we utilize these types of items that uh, may not be the, be the specific star, but incorporating them into the items, um, even if it's not, you know, every ingredient isn't necessarily sourced local, it's still impactful to the farmers, you know, if, if it can be mixed with other items. So it is, so it can meet a price point that that does meet meet the needs um, to the end end consumer and and customer. Um, so yes, yeah, still kind of thinking about what what might be the right items to focus on going into the upcoming seasons. And there's a, there's a big creativity point with what Kevin's doing and the differentiating factor there. You know, kind of what what Amy was saying to you know what what's different. How can we make it different? So you know, I leave it up to the the chefs there to to take the crops and um, you know turn it into that final product. And the key thing from Annie is that the, the butternut being peeled saved us because back to that first slide of equitable, we pay our staff well above what people in manufacturing pay in the Boston area. So our cost of producing is higher. So anything that we can do to work in local and get production costs down so we're competitive. You know, I know off the top of my head, 480 labor hours were produced in the inner city you know, and, and a skill set, a transferable skill set of where made as much soup in a day as, you know, some of the local soup companies, maybe not that, but of that skew we did. So, um, yeah, the more people get involved, the, the, the longer the run rate is, the lower the cost, and we continue to grow out that food system of local. That's great. I, I'll give you each uh, a chance for any last thing if you want. I also want to mention that... Um, you know, we're sort of in the business of helping folks find information and connections. If there's things that are sparked by this webinar that say, hey, here's here's a need, feel free to contact any of us um, at FINE, as well as um, thank you all to the presenters for putting your email links in the chat. And we'll make sure that that's available afterward as well. We also have a, a polling question that we want to ask to get your feedback on, on how this went and suggestions for other, um, other webinars coming forward. So appreciate you taking a, a second to, to fill that out. Before we wrap up, just um, Amy, Annie, Kevin, any last things you'd like to say, um, final thoughts? You've already given us tons of uh, ideas and thoughts and suggestions, so really appreciate that. But last words? Uh, thanks, thanks to you and Fine for uh, sharing, helping us share the story with everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much, and thank you. I hope that we inspired all of you. Yeah, thanks, Peter, for putting this together. If you want to learn anything more about what we're doing here, go on www.commonwealthkitchen.org. If you want to support us, JennaCommonwealthKitchen.org. And if you're a farmer or if you're a small family farmer out there and you need, you know, value added pro uh, uh, product work, you can find us. There's a separate tab on the website and give me your pickles, give me your cukes, give me your beets, bring them wow. this way. We'll turn them into something for you. Great. And on those notes, um, yeah, thank you all for your presentation, sharing all the work you did to make this this uh, story come to life and, and all you do on a regular basis. And thanks to all of you for, um, for tuning in, your good questions, listening. And we, we're really eager to keep the, the conversations going through these webinars, the summit, other events we do. Thanks for filling out this poll. And uh, we'll be back in touch with the recording and other uh, opportunities that are coming up. Have a great afternoon.